capital because every time it's a different crossroads. And at the first lecture in Oslo in March, the crossroads was very close to Kiev. And at the latest lecture I have delivered in Trondheim, it was very close to Kherson. And now it is somewhere around Bakhmut, and we'll be talking uh, in, in detail about that a new crossroads. And I will not uh, give you a long lecture. I will try to cut myself shorter because I am very interested in your, in, in your feedback, in your questions, in your responses, and particularly in your criticism, because, because it's a very difficult topic for me. It doesn't get any easier with any new, new lecture. I am uh, emotionally involved, uh, no denial of that, and it clouds my judgment. And that's why your feedback uh, will be so important. And I have to say that on a dark day, like this Monday, for instance, I question myself. That I do it every day, and today is the day 288. And I've been speaking and writing on that uh, all these days. And does it make a tiniest bit of difference? That's kind of, I feel we are going deeper and deeper into that territory, and people don't want to go there. People want to speak about different topics of interest to them, like climate change. And Russia isn't able to make any uh, meaningful contribution for the COP27 at uh, uh, Sharm el Sheikh uh, this month. People want to follow World Cup, uh, and it's hard to imagine that the previous one was in, in Russia, in fact, and organized very successfully. Uh, and nobody is missing Russia now in uh, Qatar. Uh, so all these words, all these kind of articles and lectures I delivered, does it make a tiniest bit of difference? Uh, Russia is sinking deeper and deeper into the black hole of self-destruction. And then I take a listen to the uh, presentation by Ilya Yashin, uh, 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 one of the younger leaders of Russian opposition, and he delivers the presentation in the court this Monday. Uh, he is accused in high treason, and his high treason is speaking against the war. And in his presentation, in his last word, he is saying, he is reminding about the old principle of Soviet dissidents. Do what you must and come what may. And he apparently believes in that words matter. He is going to be convicted in high treason tomorrow. And one, on one high authority I have that at the beginning there was a word. So maybe words indeed matter. So here we go. Three wars. Not one war in Ukraine. <clears throat> Three wars at least. One in Ukraine we will be discussing in greater detail, and it is at the moment uh, both on a bit of a, having a bit of a pause on the battlefields and a lot of developments around. But there is uh, another war, and no, make no doubt, looking from Moscow, it is a war. Russia is involved in the real war with the West. It's not a Cold War even. And there's a lot of new uh, dimensions to this war which we didn't have uh, when I was uh, so much younger and working at the Soviet Defense Ministry back then. Energy and uh, wheat, uh, cyber uh, and migration, they're all instruments in this war which Russia is waging in the West. And you can see in this slide the Nord Stream pipeline which Russia uh, sabotaged. Um, a, few, a few weeks ago. So that's the second war, Russia against the West. And there is a third war at the same time, which Putin's regime is waging against Russian society, against Russian culture, against Russia's future. And that's the uh, last cover page of uh, Nova Gazeta, which got the Nobel Prize uh, in uh, 2001 and is now banned in Moscow. And Memorial, which is a laureate this year, is also banned in, uh, in Russia. The ceremony is uh, coming soon. So I'm quite sure that in the kinetic war in Ukraine, uh, Russia is having one setback after another, and it's generally 
moving closer to defeat. In the war against the West, uh, I don't think Russia stands a chance. As long as the West remains united, held its, its act together, uh, Russia is on the track uh, of a defeat. In the third war, however, in the, that one, that's where I, uh, my worries are, because I think Putin may still be winning. The war didn't come out of nothing. The war was never due. Uh, and there are three different backgrounds to these three wars. They were kind of gradually coming up. And uh, one of the backgrounds is about Ukraine, which Putin denies uh, any identity. Uh, and you don't need to be Ukrainian uh, to see how false it is. Kiev, after all, was uh, set up by Swedish Vikings, and Moscow wasn't. And Ukraine, uh, for many centuries, were a part of the uh, Polish-Lithuanian kingdom, and Moscow was dominated by the Golden Horde, which is a significant difference. So Ukraine is, uh, through, the, through its history, uh, shaped up as a, as a fairly unique and very uh, particular European state. There is a second background, a second world war, uh, about Russia's relations with Europe. <clears throat> and you sometimes hear that Russia is always confronting Europe, that Russia is always against. Russia is as the other to Europe. And you see here Peter the Great at the Battle of uh, Poltava. He was really uh, the uh, Tsar which connected Russia with Europe. And in that war with Sweden, he had European allies. And through many centuries, Russia always had European allies. Alexander I had allies in his struggle against Napoleon. Uh, Nicholas II had European allies in the First World War. Even Stalin had European allies in the Second World War. Uh, there was a war where Russia really confronted Europe. It was a Crimean War in the middle of the 19th century. That was an interesting exception with very predictable outcome. That's the second background. And I can go at the great length on every of them, and I will not. Please ask me questions. And the third background is the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the indestructible Union, uh, which was forever until it wasn't. Uh, its you know, breakdown seemed so miraculously peaceful in the year 91. I was there, and there, it was indeed um, a moment uh, to remember, an experience uh, entirely unforgettable. And through that dissolution, every newborn state found various advantages of being independent. Uh, from Moldova to Turkmenistan, each state kind of have, finds its different way in international affairs. Russia is the only one which suffers from uh, the syndrome uh, of, um, of that dissolution, the resentment. Is, has been very strong and Putin deliberately cultivated it, fanned it up. Uh, so the miraculously peaceful breakdown uh, resonated now, 30 years later, in that war, which is very much uh, a consequence of that, uh, um, the, uh, of that uh, big uh, miraculous uh, breakdown of an, old, of an old empire. What comes out very clearly from the very beginning, <clears throat> from February 24, that, uh, you know, it, it is a blunder, that uh, the war, uh, which was predictable in many ways, which was uh, really coming up and shaping up, and you know, many American experts were pointing at these maps, and then these images and saying everything is in place for the war to start. And I back then argued together with my many uh, colleagues, particularly in Moscow, and it's, it wasn't possible uh, for various reasons. The economists found the war entirely nonsensical. From an economic point of view, it makes no sense whatsoever. Nobody profits. Everybody loses. Um, sociologists have their own reasons, uh, had their own reasons for disbelieving. Uh, my reasons were that, uh, yes, the kind of troops are gathered on the borders, but Ukraine is not Georgia, it's a big European state. You need at least three times more to conquer Ukraine. You cannot achieve the goals with this, uh, with these troops. Uh, I had big argument with Michael Kaufman uh, in February on that, and he was right. 
uh, with that with those troops Russia really started the war certainly and I feel that every day of this war proves that I was also right Russia didn't have enough um, and is not going to have enough and uh, mobilization or not um, Ukraine um, comes up uh, victorious in that war which was which was really a, a big blunder and the blunder had many roots not just those all those backgrounds which were kind of determining the war but Putin's miscalculations to the war were very intensely personal it's for, in the, for him kind of history and geopolitics are just um, justification his real calculations are always very personal he met Biden in Geneva and so uh, kind of an aging leader of a very divided, uh, disorderly country and thought, well, I can, um, he will not be able to uh, organize a meaningful coalition. Putin met many times with European leaders from Macron uh, to the leaders of the European Union and really thought that um, Europe is so divided, particularly after Brexit, it would never be able to get its act together uh, sanctions would be symbolic. Uh, it's something I can uh, easily manage. He definitely underestimated President Zelensky, who is now recognized by, by many media platforms as a man of the year. Uh, and he really emerged as an incredible uh, leader of his country, not only gathering international support, but uniting the country uh, in a very difficult moment. Uh, it was indeed very possible to underestimate him you know he came to the power entirely uh, unprepared he really raised to the challenge and Putin also underestimated very clearly uh, President Xi Jinping thinking that it will be uh, a friendship without limits as it was declared in Beijing two weeks prior to the war um, he hoped for a very su significant support from China and got only something very symbolic. All these miscalculations resulted in a very, uh, for Russia, unfortunate developments in the war. But what I want to emphasize is that it's not the same war. It changes all the time. Planning in Moscow uh, is not just firm set. And you always hear that Putin always doubles the stake, always goes for escalation, always tries to kind of prevail by um, going a step further. It's not quite the case. There were many uh, decisions in Moscow in the course of this war which were about retreats. From Kiev, you probably remember that convoy, uh, because Kiev was indeed initially the main goal of the war capturing Kyiv, changing the, uh, the, the government in Ukraine. Uh, as there was a plan for uh, conquering Donbass on that map, which was indeed very possible after your retreat from Kyiv, if you put your efforts uh, correctly, was possible. But again, the decision was taken uh, not to proceed. Decision to re withdraw from Kherson, again, one of those um, very painful decisions. So somehow the top brass are very reluctantly are able to deliver to Putin who doesn't, as any autocrat, as any dictator, doesn't like bad news at all. Nevertheless, you know, bad news are delivered uh, and uh, plans are changing. And I cannot really say you what is the current plan except to, uh, except to buy time except to pull the wall longer, except to uh, make it more protracted, which doesn't really, which isn't very sensible. I think one of the crucial mistakes was done during uh, summer, during midsummer, when it was a high mark of Russian aggression, when the whole of Luhansk region was captured uh, with Severodonetsk. Um, and at that moment, it was very possible for Putin uh, to annex that region and to announce a partial, very sm much smaller mobilization which, uh, than he did uh, because already then, at midsummer, it was clear that Russia had a shortage of troops for the first time of its history. There were always enough uh, soldiers in the, in the Russian army and it was short of soldiers. 
the decision was postponed until September. And it was only in September that then suddenly many, many Russians discovered that there is a real war. Because before that, it was some sort of special operation somewhere down there, very limited in scope, and most people didn't want really to hear about it. And suddenly mobilization and annexation, annexation which doesn't really make much sense because you're announcing that Russia, Russian borders have moved, uh, Russia is now uh, uh, incorporated new territories which are not really controlled. Uh, half of that territory is under U Ukrainian control, and it's uh, it's only uh, Russia is retreating further. Borders are compromised. Russian territorial integrity is compromised. But most of all, what really hit Russia is mobilization. Three hundred thousand is not very tall number, uh, you, you you might think, but three times as many Russians left, going through in every direction. Georgia and Kazakhstan via Georgia to Armenia um, uh, to, to the Baltic states um, so uh, the shock to the society the, to the economy uh, was quite strong and it continues because there there is too much evidence how badly the mobilization is organized that the armed forces are not able to incorporate all those mobilized to arm them and equip them to feed them um, the old Soviet infrastructure of mobilization for a long protracted war uh, is partly rotten, part, partly dismantled. Um, so the uh, capacity of the state to build a large army isn't anymore there. The population, yes, is still uh, 130 million, but you cannot really build an army of even 2 million. Uh, because there is no uh, no industry, no economy, no uh, reserves uh, for that. So the shock of this very bad mobilization continues. And the society, I, see, I hope, is discovering more and more how badly the whole thing is going. Which brings the real question for this uh, crossroads. What we're having now after withdrawal from Kherson, and it was a really firm decision to hold that big territory on the wrong, on the far side of River Dnipro, and uh, until really difficult decision became unavoidable, and the, the, the uh, withdrawal happened, uh, and after that withdrawal, we had several weeks uh, of very low activity in the fronts. Will that pause continue? Will we have another surprise during the winter war? Uh, uh, winter is not really a bad time for, uh, for having uh, combat operations because the ground is, after the, we had mud time uh, in uh, November, where it's very difficult to do anything, a lot of mud. You, you can see in southern Ukraine in particular, everything is sinking in the mud. Um, now it's frozen. Now the ground is solid. Will we have um, uh, another breakthrough in the war? And I don't expect this breakthrough to come from Russia. Mobilization isn't really providing for that. Whether Ukraine will be able to, uh, to do that. And we have several, oh no, wrong direction, uh, things to, con uh, to consider about Russian performance in the war. Um, how surprisingly uh, poor Russian uh, military machine um, works. Uh, there were a lot of expectations about Russian cyber capabilities. And what we have now is, going to be, yes, there, are some, so there have been several attacks, but Ukraine is entirely able to withstand, not to mention other, uh, other things. About Russian Navy, how kind of strong and modernized the Russian Navy is. There were all sorts of demonstrations, particularly in the, uh, in the high north. And you see here the flagship of the Black Sea. Uh, cruiser Moskva, which was sunk spectacularly uh, in the Black Sea. Navy is underperforming very clearly. All these modern battalion tactical groups, uh, which kind of were the new thing in Russian uh, uh, strategy, uh, really uh, performed very poorly. And on that river crossing, uh, a lot of uh, equipment is uh, destroyed. And if at the beginning of the war, uh, there was a lot of armor in the Russian uh, military and not enough soldiers for that. 
Now it's a different situation. Uh, more soldiers due to mobilization, not enough armor for them, not enough equipment. Uh, a part of the Russian military that underperformed most spectacularly is the air. Uh, air power. When I spoke about that at greater length in Trondheim in the uh, air, air Force uh, Academy, uh, that that's one component of modern war where Russia was supposed to have clear dominance. Ukraine Air Force is, is, is pretty weak and Russia showed the, its capacity for Air Force in Syria, uh, where a lot of pilots got uh, uh, training and com uh, combat experience. And Russia isn't really able to establish any dominance of the skies in Ukraine. It has now to rely more on this sort of drones imported from Iran, which is a very primitive weapon. It cannot really be called a drone, because drone is something you control, you operate. Uh, and these things is launched and then goes its own way without any maneuvering uh, direct trajectory, <coughs> going rather slowly and producing a lot of noise. So Ukrainians are getting better at intercepting them. And now Russian air bases like this one with strategic bombers are being hit by Ukrainian drones, which really is a huge embarrassment, to the, uh, not only to the Russian Air Force, but to the whole kind of Russian, um, Russian military. What Putin can do next? And that big picture shows you the uh, Azovstal in, uh, in uh, uh, Mariupol site of kind of great uh, siege and great destruction, uh, which uh, gives you an, an idea how destructive this war is. But options for Putin uh, after all this destruction, after all this investment, after all this weakening of Russian military machine, are in fact quite limited. He is in a very tight corner indeed. And there is certainly no <clears throat> capacity for horizontal escalation. You hear it very often that the war can go into other directions. And the Baltic states in particular are very keen to, uh, to ring that bell. But in fact, uh, that map which showed all the Russian uh, uh, battalion uh, divisions which were able to dominate the Baltic theater are now all wasted in Ukraine. The Baltic states now entirely safe uh, because there is no, uh, no forces to attack them. Finland and Sweden can join NATO without worry about Russian uh, countermeasures because again, all the Russian forces are already, uh, already gone. Russia tried some other measures of horizontal escalation and these are grain ships uh, um, in, uh, in Odessa, Russia tried to, to manipulate that and even tried to cancel the uh, grain deal and wasn't able to because Turkey said, mm -mm, grain deal continues and Putin had to go, uh, go along with that. So very little capacity for escalation even in this direction. The only, the only thing, uh, resource, the only instrument which remains available for Putin is nuclear. And that's a worrisome thought. And that's something we need to take in, uh, very seriously. And Putin demonstrated that uh, instrument right before going into war with these uh, exercises. And there are kind of uh, various options how it can be used with the kind of very modern uh, weapons. That is a, a hyper hypersonic uh, air-launched uh, missile, Kinjal, tried a couple of times in Ukraine, really works. Um, and you, you can, uh, after all, hit some Ukrainian uh, nuclear power stations, and that will be a, a nuclear escalation of sorts. So it is something uh, we really need to take very seriously, particularly if it's about non-strategic weapons, which have been kind of locked in storages for 30 years, uh, which need to be tested before being used. And the test site on Nova Zemlya is probably where it might happen, uh, something not that far uh, from uh, 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 Norwegian borders in the middle of the Arctic, um, which might have, again, it's not uh, something outrageous. It's not going across nuclear threshold. It's just uh, breaking the test ban treaty, uh, which is not ratified by United States and not by China. And Russia can't do that. Uh, so, so again, many the nuclear dimensions of this war 
uh, need to be watched very carefully. My take is that it is preventable by the combination of deterrence and dissuasion. Deterrence mostly from the West, dissuasion coming from China, which doesn't want to see that. Uh, it can be prevented. Uh, while kind of that's kind of Putin's uh, ultimate weapon, it still can be uh, can be kept under uh, under control. Sorry, here. So after that long war or a fast defeat, and most uh, expert opinions now are that war will continue. It will be long war of attrition. It will be a protracted war, and in many ways, it is a very convenient option. Yes, something uh, in the West uh, will be easy to deal with. Supplying Ukraine uh, and knowing that Russian uh, military-industrial complex will not be able to ever to compete with the, with the West. Russia is not the Soviet Union. Uh, it's not really capable of sustaining uh, a long war. It is a designated loser in the, in, in the long war. Um, hardly any... Uh, any doubt about that. On that trajectory, uh, things look uh, in many ways comfortable for the West, even if uh, difficult for, uh, for Ukraine, but pretty hopeless for Russia. But could it be something else? Uh, could, it be, can you, could it mean that Russia in this uh, attrition will not be able to take it? Doesn't have really stomach for a long war of attrition. All sort of uh, internal breakdown is uh, is possible. Uh, very suddenly, uh, it is a um, uh, thing which Russia is entirely capable of self-destruction. Uh, done it several times, uh, uh, several times before. Uh, this is also a risk which needs to be watched, needs to be taken uh, carefully, particularly since the thing which Putin's regime fears most is not the Western intervention, is not even the Western support for Ukraine. It is this combination of revolution and the coup. Uh, people coming out in the streets uh, and the elites uh, really breaking the ranks uh, with, uh, with Putin. What is more uh, probable, how it, it can be combined? This is a threat which Putin probably uh, is most worried about. And we know from experience of revolutions, that one shows you uh, streets in Belarus in the year 2020, how suddenly it comes, how unpredictable, how uh, the explosion of um, the public anxiety can bring people on the streets. Um, yes, Russia has a repressive apparatus, but it's not something which is overwhelming. Uh, it's not really a you know, Stalinist regime, not even the regime in North Korea. There are many weaknesses, <coughs> in, in, in much corruption in that. But still, for, the, for Putin's elites, uh, every sign of growing discontent might be a sign that the core of our problem is with the great leader. Much the same way as President Xi Jinping uh, makes himself the core of the Chinese Communist Party, Putin has made himself the core of the war problem. Without removing that uh, core, you cannot uh, approach the solution. It's too obvious for too many people in his, uh, in his Kremlin. I am, uh, another thing about the coups is they always come incredibly suddenly. You have no signs, no warnings, and that's the only uh, recipe for uh, success. Uh, and Putin is probably quite worried every time he gathers people uh, around long table, and that's why he much prefers still to have it virtual. Uh, most of his meetings, most of his communications, still, uh, even uh, after the long period of self-isolation, are still going uh, virtually. Here is my last slide, and I promised you not to give you a long lecture. Whatever happens with the war, whatever is the outcome, this we will not see. This is impossible. Russia will always be there as a source of, uh, of many uh, troubles, many worries, and many risks. And what sort of Russia we will have after that war uh, is, is very hard to predict. Uh, we, oh, we know where it's going. 
Russia is going to be defeated. Uh, the West is committed, the Ukraine is firm set of this court. How this defeat will be internalized? Uh, yes, that's, uh, that's a very hard thing to swallow. Um, how to deal with the, uh, with the defeated Russia, which, again, post-Putin Russia, certainly. Um, because with Putin, it's hardly possible to, uh, to get any uh, meaningful, uh, meaningful dialogue, even if uh, the um, readiness to do talk is very often uh, declared. The road to peace might open only after Putin's uh, d departure, and uh, as I have mentioned, his, uh, his elites are probably uh, considering uh, that without him, uh, the road might, uh, might open uh, much easily. And we hear very mixed signals about that. Macron is saying that uh, in the future European architecture, security architecture, we will need to grant Russia some security guarantees. We will need to engage. We will somehow need to relate to that. We cannot build a, a wall around that space and live uh, in, in confrontation. From the Baltic states, from the Poland, from Ukraine in particular, you always hear Russia will always be a threat. Russia is firm set on its imperial path. Yeah, there cannot be another, um, another Russia. And it's difficult to argue with, with Ukrainians in particular, uh, because uh, they are really uh, in the, uh, in the dif in most difficult position. They are carrying the heaviest burden in, uh, in this war. They are suffering from the uh, missile strikes and from the cold. Uh, but I cannot really quite subscribe to that. Uh, as I've mentioned in its history, uh, its long history, uh, relations between Russia and Europe were never really entirely confrontational. The conflict between Russia and Europe is something historically uh, new. And um, many new opportunities for engaging with Russia, for kind of guiding its post-war development might be opened uh, and needed, uh, will need to be explored. But we need to make sure first that Ukraine prevails, that the war comes to a, uh, to a conclusion in which Ukraine uh, is uh, <coughs> able to uh, rebuild itself, to restore uh, its state, to uh, make sure its territorial integrity is uh, reconstituted. But in many ways, it's much easier to think in the direction how to help Ukrainian rehabilitation. What sort of martial plan will be needed? And many politicians are eager to add their names to that future plan. Uh, it's much more difficult to think about how to deal uh, with the Russia. And we don't have any uh, ready recipes, but we need to keep an open mind on that. And I think I will try to put uh, and then to the presentation here. And I very much hope to get your questions and your criticism. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pavel, for this introduction. It's really complicated. Uh, I think I was listening to Jens Stoltenberg this morning and in the university aula and he said that our relationship or the West relationship to Russia is changed forever. And of course, uh, launching this brutal war, uh, Putin has closed some doors, at least for himself. But I would like to ask you when I will collect uh, questions from uh, the audience, I would like to start by asking you, I know that uh, Alexander Navalny, he wrote a piece for Washington Post, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, when he said that um, uh, to secure European security, we need a uh, Russia with a parliamentarian democratic system where the leaders are voted away <laughs> and that they can be held accountable for what they are doing. 
Is there any chance, do you see in the future, that Russia can develop into a parliamentary system, a true democracy? Sorry about that. And please give me a sign if you would like to ask a question. It is quite remarkable that Alexei Navalny, who is really treated very harshly in, uh, in Russian prison, who is going to punish in every possible way, Yes, sorry about that. Modern technology is not always um, that easy to master. Uh, it's quite remarkable that Alexei Navalny, being where he is, is first able to communicate at all. And second, that he remains so positive that he continues to, kind of to develop uh, for Russia uh, a political project uh, which he really tried to um, uh, present in several elections uh, in, in Moscow and in Russia, and for which he is so, uh, so severely punished. We can hear more or less the same uh, train of thought from Khodorkovsky. Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was in the same position as Navalny, is now, is now in, the, um, in the West is trying to contribute and there's a remarkable uh, confluence of these views and probably not only because they are both have uh, similar prison experience but because the thinking goes in the same way if russia has a future it must be a very different future uh, it cannot be taken for granted yes russia is very capable of self-destruction and that is something we all want to prevent because um, a state with such nuclear cap capabilities, with such difficult um, history and such com uh, complex comp domestic composition, uh, catastrophe there will be uh, a disaster which we would rather want to avoid. So if there is a future, we want to break this pattern mm. of self-reproducing dictatorship of self-reproducing autocracy, and we have examples of that uh, not only in Russia, but in, uh, in, many, in many other states. And parliamentarianism, hard as it is to imagine, and again, Russian parliamentarism, its history is um, not particularly encouraging, um, is um, again hard to imagine, but then the war was hard to imagine. Yeah. And we need to think uh, really out of this war box uh, into the future. Mm. Definitely not just the parliamentarianism, but also a different way of um, f federalization of this huge territory. It cannot really be uh, run from one center uh, which controls everything. It's a hopeless uh, thing. Only dictatorship is able to do that. You have parliamentarianism. You need to combine it with a different kind of federal um, uh, federal structure. But uh, I am very much inclined to share uh, that difficult optimism uh, from behind bars, so to say, <laughs> which Alexei Navalny is trying to, uh, to bring forward. Uh, I do think that there is a hope for Russia of being not always a threat to its neighbors, like the Baltic states uh, worry like the Ukraine war, like Georgia in particular worry. I think Georgia mm. probably at this moment has most reasons to worry because uh, it's not safe, unlike, unlike the Baltic state. It doesn't have NATO protection. It's very close to Russia. It is um, a place where Putin suddenly might decide to kind of distract attention to. Uh, but parliamentarianism, I mm. think, again, uh, a lot depends upon Ukraine, by the way. Of course. How Ukraine will come out of this war whether it will be able to show Russia an example, mm. not only of a leader which brings the country, which is needed at the moment, but of a working model of par par parliamentarianism. Mm. So I think Ukraine, um, how it will relate to, uh, to Russia after the victory, that's a, kind of a very important question. Let me follow up on that because um, uh, Mr. Stoltenberg also said today uh, that Ukraine will have to decide by their own if they want to negotiate with Russia or not. And actually when <laughs> they eventually want to negotiate, it's up to the Ukrainians uh, themselves. 
I know that someone in Norway has talked about we need peace negotiations and you know so forth. Uh, in your opinion, is it possible to negotiate with uh, Russia? Because this is a war of choice. It's not a war of necessity. Putin wants to control Ukraine, all of Ukraine. Uh, he doesn't do it because he, he can't, because he's not able to do it with this military force that he has. So how to trust a piece of paper of the negotiations signed by Vladimir Putin? Yes, it is a difficult question. And I am very often frustrated with this question myself. I, after all, work in the Peace Research Institute for 30 years. I'm a professional peacenik. Exactly. And yes. then sometimes from journalists, I hear this question. You sound like a war hawk. You must uh, 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 professionally speak in terms of peace. And I say the road to peace goes now through more war. It is very unfortunate, but that's, uh, th that's the fact of life. Uh, even if some in Russia would prefer to have a freeze, uh, to have kind of a bit of a pause, uh, to kind of sort out the, the, the immediate military problems, even if more people in Russia are really ready to negotiate with Ukraine opinion polls, whatever opinion polls are now in, uh, in Russia indicates very clearly that people prefer to have a negotiated solution. But negotiating with Putin is impossible. I think he positioned himself, as in one of my slides, in such a corner where he is uh, a person with whom it's impossible to have any meaningful conversation. Uh, well, it, there is still a point in having communication channels open, uh, and the United States does it, and Erdogan does that. Um, communicating with Putin is important, not least in order to prevent nuclear escalation. But as for the road to peace, um, I think more difficult questions will come after Putin's uh, disappearance. Because I think his own elite will uh, be contemplating very seriously uh, opportunities for terminating him with extreme prejudice. Mm. But they will be the same people, essentially. There will be nobody, there will be no, not Navalny from prison. No. It will be very much the same kind of grouping of people, much the same way as after Stalin, we knew all these people. Uh, how responsible they are for the war, how corrupt they are. Uh, not a nice uh, group of people to negotiate with. Nevertheless, uh, after that, opportunities for dialogue need to be explored and step by step a chain of compromises I think can be uh, moved forward and it will not be necessary after all for Ukraine to contemplate a military attack on Crimea. I think before that there will be a, 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 a political road uh, towards um, the restoring Ukrainian territorial integrity. Uh, it is not something Ukraine needs to uh, devote strategic thinking towards. Mm. It's much more about political solutions. It's much more about uh, Russian kind of gradual acceptance of defeat, how it will continue, where it will retreat first, to the status quo until February 21st, mm. uh, from the uh, other regions in Donbass. What makes it difficult for any Russian elite to, uh, to go into this track is that there is a formal annexation. It's now Russian territory. Yeah. Uh, it's a blunder again of such, uh, of such proportion that, you know, you start ne negotiating further retreats, you are committing high treason, mm. constitutionally. So it is, uh, there are many questions there to, uh, to deal with. Nevertheless, I think that negotiations with the post-Putin uh, leadership, probably collective leadership, will be necessary, not, ju not just possible because nobody needs new spasms of this war. Nobody wants the uh, risk of nuclear escalation to, hmm. uh, to go further high. Thank you. Um, da skal jeg åpne for noen spørsmål. Pavel forstår utmerket norsk. Man kan, så det går an å stille spørsmål på norsk hvis man ønsker det. Uh, reis dere opp. Dere som ønsker spørsmål, så får dere en mikrofon bak deg, uh, Andreas. Nei, Anders. 
at the back. Uh, pre, uh, I can take it in English. Uh, Appreciate four, that. four years councillor at the Norwegian Embassy in Kiev till yeah. 1920, 50 years with Afghanistan. Uh, first of all, it was very nice to hear that you mentioned this about the difference between the part of Kiev Rus that Ukraine is today, which has, in a way, inherited a democratic tradition actually from the Vikings, and the tiny part of Kiev Rus where Moscow and Tsar Russia developed that actually was uh, uh, mainly influenced by the uh, Mongols and autocrat autocracy, which we see today. That is, I mean, you don't hear that too often. So that was very, very nice to hear because that's an interesting aspect of the history behind the present conflict. But I was one of those that did not think that Russia would uh, invade uh, Ukraine uh, at the beginning or end last year, beginning of this year. And the reason for that was Soviet Union mm -hmm. failure in Afghanistan mm -hmm. between 79 and 89. 10 years of war, a lot of soldiers lost. Actually, they had to withdraw. And I thought that Russia had actually, or Soviet Union had gained some experience that would actually influence the military leadership of today. And since you also worked in the Ministry of, Foreign, uh, of Defense, you might know, I mean, to what extent do one draw experiences? The second question is related to Kherson. Uh, Kherson is, well, it's a city on the uh, western side of Dnipro. But what is perhaps more interesting is that a little bit uh, northeast of Kherson is Nova Kahovka, which is this dam on Dnipro, that is one thing, but this is the dam that actually also is the start of this uh, freshwater channel to Crimea, which Ukraine closed in 2014 when uh, when Russia annexed uh, Crimea and which resulted in tremendous problems in Crimea with uh, saltification of the groundwater and uh, whatnot. And to what I have heard from close friends is that the Russians have also evacuated Novakovka. And the question is how long time will it go before the Ukrainians again close this channel that must be quite a challenge for the russians mm. thank you peter uh pavel yes. two good questions indeed uh as for as far as history is concerned yes that's a hugely interesting uh theme and um what putin writes about ukrainian kind of history and identity uh, is so uh, obviously fake so obviously doesn't have any ground in any fact that it's difficult even to take an argument with that. Uh, it appears to make, uh, to make no sense. But nevertheless, his key point uh, about Russian and Ukrainian people being so close, being so intertwined that nearly one people, that resonates with many, uh, with many in Russia. Because indeed, there are so many family ties, there are so many common histories, there are so, so much commonality. Uh, you know, you can understand Ukrainian after a couple of days uh, there. Uh, it's about the same difference as between Norwegian and Danish, uh, probably um, even less. So, uh, difference in history is one thing, but the uh, closeness of the two people is another story. And I think that we see, unfortunately, how the two people are being teared apart, how the crimes committed by the Russian army is making every Russian an enemy for Ukrainian people. And it's very, it, I find it very sad. Uh, I find that very uh, painful. The uh, question about uh, me, uh, water channel to, to Crimea. Yes, one of the um, uh, very uh, much discussed matters uh, on the, uh, in, uh, before the war, uh, how the water supplies to Crimea are organized, whether Russia is able to, uh, after the, uh, the conquest, to reopen the, uh, the, uh, this um, uh, channel 
I think the problem is not, is not only that um, it is now in the kind of, uh, in the kind of immediate uh, war zone and uh, uh, Russians cannot uh, maintain um, administration of Nova Ekahovka because it's too close to the uh, to the uh, battleground. The problem is also that the infrastructure, the kind of very physical infrastructure of this waterway, uh, after kind of so many years of uh, unused, has deteriorated, and Russia in this nine months of, of control wasn't able to invest much in that. It, they tried to reopen, but it discovered more problems than they able to manage. So in this way, a problem of water supply to Crimea can really be resolved only after the combat activities w w will be done. Uh, it is not just opening the dam and the water goes uh, goes to Crimea. The uh, the structure has uh, become really impossible to um, uh, to maintain. So it is uh, it is a question for the uh, kind of post war uh, post war regulation. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. What was your first question? Afghanistan. Yes, of course. Didn't Afghanistan. They learn sorry, anything? sorry about missing that uh, that train of thought. Yeah, you know, in the Russian military, that war was always kind of an unfortunate episode. Even in the, uh, in the high moment of Afghanistan, when a hundred thousand of Russian troops were there. It was still half a million Russian troops in East Germany. That was always the main theater where kind of the key planning, where the kind of the main resources, the main attention was concentrated. That was seen as some, uh, from the very beginning in many military quarters as a mistake uh, committed through all sorts of kind of political miscalculations, a war which was a necessary distraction. Uh, from which it was indeed important to get out as soon as possible. And it wasn't really seen as a model uh, for the campaign uh, in Ukraine, because between them there were many other. Uh, in its post-Soviet period, Russia had so many military uh, experiences of different kind, from, I don't know, uh, Bosnia to Tajikistan, from Chechnya to uh, um, uh, Abkhazia and uh, uh, Transnistria. Many engagements, many experiences, and then generally in most of them, military were able to make a useful difference. Uh, not, in, not, not excluding Syria, and in particular the operation in Crimea, the uh, uh, miraculous annexation of that territory without any violence, without any bloodshed, without a single shot being mm. fired, I think that created in the Russian both political leadership and in the military an impression that that old legacy of Afghanistan is, is irrelevant. We are now in a different world, in a different situation. Ukraine is an entirely different uh, case from Afghanistan. Indeed, is, each war is, is special in Syria experience in Syria, which Russia tried to learn very hard, rotating a lot of uh, high officers uh, through that conflict, it wasn't really very informative. It's not at all um, uh, the Russia discovered that Syria is uh, <coughs> an entirely different situation. <coughs> and that uh, victory which Russia supposed to, uh, to score there wasn't in any way reproducible in Ukraine. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel. Uh, I think uh, the time is up for some coffee. Maybe Jeg ser at uh, vi også har fått vår neste uh, speaker uh, in i lokale, Henrik Hiem. Han skal snakke om den andre autoritære stormakten som utfordrer oss og vårt vestlige system. Så Russland gjør det til gangs, og du har, eh, synes jeg, på en veldig god måte beskrevet det egentlig, den fortvilelsen eh, som både veldig mange russere selv føler, men også vi i vest. Altså Russland kan ikke trylles vekk. Det er vårt naboland som vi må leve med, og vi ønsker jo en annen utvikling, og at også Russland kan bli en del av et fredelig Europa. 
Men tusen takk til Pave Kaja. Gi ham en stor applaus.